Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. So what do we want to talk about today? Just attachments, different kinds of attachments. Many times we used to call them precision attachments, denoting or connotating some sort of extremely precise fit of the different components of the attachments. Now one of the places, if you're interested, is this is literally the website. Okay, if you go to Google and type in Attachments International in a Google search, and then it'll come up and you go ahead and you click on this website, this is basically what you're going to get. Better turn my... You're going to get this website. So you go ahead and you click down on the side choices right here, and what you'll get is you can go to pages that will talk about the introduction. And this is a fairly exhaustive explanation of the different kinds of attachments that may be used and their different uses. Now there is literally a plethora of attachments. For those of you that are grammatically challenged, plethora means a lot, okay? So there's lots of different kinds of attachments. Typically, having done these for years, my time frame on how long I want these things to last without a lot of maintenance issues on my part, as I practice more, it gets longer. So to me, a three or a five year time frame ain't long enough. I'm into 15 or 20 years or 20 years plus. And if I've got to do maintenance on them, the more simple the maintenance procedures are, the better. And so if you look through these attachment catalogs or go through this website, there are many extremely seductive looking attachments because they look sort of like a Rolex watch. You're going, ooh, ooh, that'll be so, click springs and pops and they'll go, ooh, God, this is so cool. Well, part of the thing is, now think about maintaining them. So my standard line, when you've just broken the distal marginal ridge off an amalgam that you're putting in tooth number 15, that the cervical is way down four millimeters sub gum, you spent 20 minutes getting the matrix band on, you asked the patient to bite ever so lightly. I know none of you have ever had this happen, and the patient goes, Ugh, and it breaks up, and you're going, I'm so glad you did that. Meanwhile, both hygienists are telling you they've been waiting for five minutes for you to check their patient. Your front desk assistant says the next two patients are waiting for you. And then you get the phone call and your assistant says Mrs. McGillicuddy called and said something on her partial broke. And that's when you really don't want an extremely complex attachment mechanism on Mrs. McGillicuddy's partial. Okay. So what are attachments? It's some sort of a connecting device to sort of hook the partial to the tooth. So what you're used to or what you've been taught for the most part is what holds a partial denture to the tooth, to the retaining tooth or the primary abutment tooth, is an occlusal rest for it to rest on, a lingual reciprocal arm of some sort, and a buccal clasping arm. So with attachments, they sort of replace all that with some sort of a male-female, two halves that fit together very, very precisely. So one part goes in the tooth, the other part goes in the partial. Broadly speaking, there's two kinds of attachments, intracoronal attachments and extracoronal attachments. With intracoronal attachments, the intimately, precisely fitting A and B, male, female, whatever part you want to call it, are housed within the normal confines of the outline of the tooth. Now, obviously, to use attachments with teeth, it pre-requires that the, crown ha or the tooth has to have a crown done on it. Okay, so one person may say a downside is you must crown the tooth, you must restore the tooth that you're going to put the attachment in. Okay, so some other attachments may reside or be sort of soldered on to the distal proximal of the tooth and be suspended distally. Now these are more elegant and fit inside the tooth. Anybody have any idea what one of the main drawbacks of an intracoronal attachment might be? If you're going to make a distal proximal box big enough to house the attachment in your prep, might you find Peter Pulp along the way? Okay, answer, yes. And so just the amount of tooth reduction you have to do for an intracoronal attachment is significant. 
And if you have an individual, a younger individual, you may not have enough room between the, the surface of the tooth and the pulp of the tooth to, to house an intracoronal attachment. The problem with extracoronal attachments may be, again, if you've got this attachment sitting out here, remember that you have to fit a partial denture framework and get a tooth covering all this. So when all this is done, there's a tooth in its normal position over the top of that attachment. I'm not going to read all this. It's in your notes anyway. So here's an example of a crown, a PFM crown, on a laboratory model with an intracoronal attachment. The female aspect is incorporated in the crown itself. So the other half of that precisely fitting pair of pieces of metal that fit together is incorporated in the partial denture. So there's a close-up of the female portion of the attachment. So here again, when the PFM crown prep is performed on this tooth, you've got to make enough room on the distal to house this in the normal contour of the tooth. Is that impossible to do? Absolutely not. But one of the things to be aware of is how much room do you have axially to fit this thing within the normal confines of the tooth. And here's one of these pre-manufactured one attachments that we buy just shown next to a 10 cent piece to give you a feel for how big these are. So here's the two halves and the part that would go on the tooth you can see its shape. And then the shape of this part that goes onto the partial denture obviously interfaces in here. And these things fit very snugly and they do take some fitting when you're doing these things. So here's the part that's in the partial denture, the male half, here's the female half. So when the two go together, you've got it here that you've got the male and the female together, partial dentures in place, no lingual reciprocal arms, no buccal clasp arms. And the bottom of the attachment is the occlusal rest, and because of the, the precise fit, it is both the retentive component and the reciprocal component at the same time. So again, here's just the things showing you our model with our two attachments on it. Now, can anybody think this one, what they do not show here, is you can see in this particular model they made of a precision attachment, they did not put an indirect retainer up here. So over time, if you wanted to reline this, the idea would be that this fits so precisely up and down that you would just hold it vertically so that you could go ahead and get the reline put down here, the impression material. So how do you tell when this needs a reline? If the patient comes in and you either note mobility in the abutment tooth or you see a shiny burnish mark down here at the cervical of the abutment tooth or you see a shiny burnish mark in this area of the attachment, that would tell you that this attachment is being distally torqued. And it's twisting distally on that tooth and making burnish marks. So if that's the case, then you want to go ahead and get a reline done on that so that you get more support from the distal extension base. So here's another situation in which you've got basically a class three partial where you've got teeth in the back helping support things and we're setting precision attachments toward the front of this case. Again, there's a mandrel, there's a device that fits in a dental surveyor that this precision attachment just slides on. This is the female portion. And then you come in with your uh, working cast mounted on a surveyor table. You gently lower this down and then slide your surveyor table over so that the wax up of your crown, this is the wax up of your PFM crown, touches against the side of that and then you just incorporate the attachment into that wax pattern. And again, the easiest way to do this, it's really not difficult at all, when you get this mandrel so that this attachment on the mandrel is touching the distal of the wax up, if you just take a number seven wax spatula and get it really hot and just touch it to the side of this mandrel right up here, enough heat will travel down the mandrel and get this warm so it will start to melt the wax and it will just, with slight pressure on the surveyor table, you can just move it over and this will just be almost sucked right into the pattern. Works very nicely. So these are not difficult to set. And then for the 
male portion, again, here was the female portion that was incorporated in the tooth. The male portion has to have some way to get hooked into the partial. So what they do with the male portion is they wax up and cast what we call a strut. A strut or a crow's foot. So this is a, what looks like a lingual reciprocal arm and a little crow's foot or a little tail that will be attached to the partial denture framework with self-curing acrylic. And this little strut mechanism is soldered to the male portion of the attachment. So that's an extra little step that has to be made with these in the lab. So here's our crown that's all cast completely. Here's our male attachment in the crown. So the male and the female attachments are mated. And we're now making a pattern, typically in Duralay or GC pattern resin, of this little tail with the lingual reciprocal arm. And so this is taken off and cast in gold and soldered to the male. Here's an extra coronal attachment. So in this situation, when the crown is all made, there's this little part that's suspended off the distal of the crown with a little ball and socket piece that fits into this extra coronal attachment. So there it is. And then what we do is we have one attachment is called the ERA attachment. And you can see this is just an ad straight out of one of the throwaway journals that shows the sizes of these. And you can get the different sizes of these. Go ahead. This part fits on the distal of the tooth. And then these are little inserts that will snap into this ring. And so here's your partial denture all made. Here's the inner aspect of the partial. You can see we have to have the little ball part that will go down into this ring. It has to fit in the framework and still leave room to fit the denture tooth over the top of all this. So another critical thing if people are thinking of using precision attachments is one, do I have enough room in the potential abutment tooth to house the attachment as an intracoronal attachment? One question. And if you don't, then you do it extracoronal. But the second question that's just import, as important is, how much room do I have vertically? Because if I don't have enough room height-wise, I have to have enough room to fit this and the other half of it and still set a denture tooth over the top. So just analyzing space requirements, and they go into all of this in that Attachments International catalog that's online. If you want a hard cover of it, it's basically a, a paper book, but you can send away 30 bucks and they'll send you the thing. So you can either view it online and print it out a page at a time, or you can order it if you're interested in pursuing information about these. Here's a patient that I did, good gosh, over 25 years ago, he since passed away. He was the husband of one of our secretaries. And so what he had was upper partial de or upper complete denture, lower partial denture. Take the lights down a little bit so you can see some of this stuff a little bit better. I wonder I'm doing the, doing the wrong dimmer. OK, so upper denture, lower partial denture. Here's what he started with. So he had some severe periodontally involved teeth, an old upper denture. So the whole plan was we were going to go through two phases. Make a lower transitional partial or a lower flipper that he was going to wear for some months because we were going to extract the hopeless teeth and let these areas heal in prior to making the definitive partial denture. So teeth were there, teeth are gone. We decided to save three teeth on the patient's lower left a lower right bicuspid and a molar toward the back. So that was his occlusion. This was after some amount of healing, and this was the temporary flipper that the patient was wearing. So the idea was we're going to go ahead and crown all the remaining teeth, so we're going to crown all these, this one and this one, put a precision attachment here, put one here. So we go ahead and we prepare the teeth. Moral of the story, when you go ahead and prepare the teeth, I got spots on these teeth that really were not mechanical... They were near mechanical exposures. They weren't mechanical exposures, making room for everything. So that when I went ahead and got things all cleaned up, you'd see a little tiny dot of blood that would form over a period of about 10 seconds. And if you blotted it off with a, with a gauze, it would be nice and clean. And after about 10 seconds, again, the teeniest, teeniest little drop of blood would show again. And so what I did was cut, and uh, that happened on these two. And on this one, there was just what we call blushing. 
And so I put some life on those immediately and then replaced it through the case. As the case got all done, teeth were okay, but about four years later, this tooth needed endo, and about seven years later, this tooth needed endo. So the moral of the story is if you get any of those near exposures and you're doing some extensive work, one might consider doing the endo right out of the bat on the thing. So we get the case all set up and done. Here's our provisionals, okay, that fit our pre-existing flipper. We get the case mounted. We go ahead and do diagnostic setups, and so with our diagnostic setups done, we can get our wax-ups for our crowns done. We go ahead and cast the crowns in porcelain fused to metal, metal. And so we're going to put, obviously, porcelain on the outside of these teeth. This one's going to stay all gold. What we did on the molar back here was I wasn't putting a precision attachment in it, but I milled the lingual and proximal surface to make a ledge so that the partial denture framework would fit real intimately at the proximal and lingual. And then we have an attachment here, and we have an attachment here. The other thing we did on these that I've done on these attachment cases for years, if I'm going to use an intracoronal attachment, is I mill a lingual ledge on the lingual of my abutment teeth that are going to have the precision attachments in them. So I'm making what looks like a little lingual reciprocal arm that goes around there. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So we get the crowns done. We take uh, an impression. We go ahead and make the partial denture framework. So now the partial denture framework can be carried back to the model with our crowns on it. I set up all the teeth on the thing and go ahead and process it, get it processed and finished. So upper metal base, people will sometimes say, why do you bother to do an upper metal base denture? Occasionally with patients, if I've got an upper denture and lower natural teeth, upper denture and lower natural teeth, occasionally patients can develop enough occlusal force if they've got lower natural teeth that they crack the upper denture. And so if you repeatedly are repairing an upper denture that's been cracked, teeth have been gone for some period of time, so you don't anticipate the need for a reline at short intervals. If you make a cast metal base, we used to do it in either gold or chrome cobalt, with the cost of gold now, it's pretty much always chrome cobalt. Then you go ahead and you wind up with a denture base that you don't have to worry about breaking. So we get the thing done and put in. The other thing one must think about if one's doing a precision attachment partial. With a conventional partial, the conventional partial, you put it in when you ask the patient to take the lower partial out. They just put their thumbnails on the underside of the clasps, yes? So they just put their thumbnail under the clasp and they can lift it up. If you've got a precision attachment partial with no clasps, how do they get it out? And the answer is they either need to try to get their thumbnail under the edge of the clasp, or one can make little teeny, what these are, stainless, little stainless steel dowels that I cut a section of and embed it in the partial so that they stick out a teeny little bit of the ways so a patient can get their thumbnail under those. Sometimes what I've also done is taken something like a carborendum disc and just down toward the cervical of the first replacement tooth where it doesn't show, just take a carborendum disc and cut a very shallow little notch right in the tooth, something that the patient can get their fingernail on to remove these. Which brings us to another point with some of my graduate students historically. They would be so excited about doing a precision partial that they would get some elderly patient with a teeny little bit of a Parkinsonian tremor and then they get real excited about recommending a precision partial for this patient. Anybody see a problem? They can't put them in or get them out. And so the idea is also when selecting an attachment, if you're even thinking of going that way, what's the patient's manual dexterity so can they adequately get these things in and out? And so that's a legitimate question to be asking one's self. Different patient. Now, this individual, nice older gentleman, he said he didn't care at all about the aesthetics of the teeth, so he had two cuspids left, two eye teeth. And so he had 22 and 27, an old beat-up denture, an old partial that didn't even have clasps on it. So we went ahead and made a new denture, a precision partial, and then after we had these crowns done, he then decided after the fact, gee, maybe they are a little shiny, maybe I don't want them quite that shiny. So we took a sandblaster and we dusted 
we dusted it down so that this is after they'd been sandblasted, so they didn't seem quite so bright. So you prep the two teeth, you've got your two crowns done that have got your attachments in them, that's an occlusal view to get a feeling for the fact that these things are lined up reasonably well so that they draw perfectly. And then we go ahead and make the partial. Now, if you've got basically two lower teeth, these teeth were not endodontically treated. These teeth were vital teeth. We chose to do the conventional attachments. Assuming teeth were endodontically treated, one could then say, do I want to make an individual coping with an attachment on top of it? You'll see one of those later. Or do I want to make a bar that goes across and connects these? And if you see if it's implants, it's the same thing. If I've got two implants, do I want to have an individual attachment that will just come up in the air? Or do I want a bar that goes between these two implants? Now, sometimes in some literature they would say, if you had a bar that tied these two teeth together, or a bar that tied the two implants together, you'd get a little more lateral stabilization. What we found clinically is I don't see a tremendous difference one way or the other. And if I make a bar that goes across here and put the appropriate clips or snaps on top of the bar, can people see that this all takes up room on the inside, on the underside of the lower denture? So where the lower denture fits over whatever hardware I'm making, I have to hollow out the lower denture to make room for it to fit over this. And can people see sometimes that may weaken the lower denture? And so again, my own prejudice with more time is to try to make these cases as simple as I possibly can. And so I tend to go with just individual attachments on top of these. Maintenance issues. Very nice lady came in for a recall in the partial denture department about 30 years ago, almost 25, 30 years ago. She had worn this upper precision attachment partial for many years. She'd worn it very successfully. And what was happening now was over a long period of time where the male aspect of the partial denture fit into the female on the patient's teeth, there had been enough metal-to-metal -metal contact that these were getting somewhat loose. And so the patient said, what do you think about remaking the partial to make the, to make the partial fit tighter? Well, what had happened, as you can see from this, this happens to be a cast gold base. And over time, what had happened is the patient's lower teeth wore against the acrylic of the upper replacement teeth, eventually wore the acrylic away, and then bottomed out and, and finally stopped when it got to the framework. So can people get a picture in their mind that if you go ahead and take the partial out, ask the patient to bite together without the partial in, that the lower teeth are almost in contact with the upper ridge? You have very, very, very little inner arch space. And one of the things I talk about with attachments is you have to have a certain amount of inner arch space. And so in talking with the patient, if one was going to try to redo this, what you'd really need to do is crown lengthening to get more crown length on all the abutment teeth. You'd also have to reduce the ridge, consider doing crowns on the lower teeth to correct the plane of occlusion, and suddenly this gets exponentially bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Faced with all that, the patient said, gee, is there any way we can tighten this up? So what I did was took an impression, just poured a cast up into the partial, and then bent some stainless steel wrought wire clasp to fit in here, trying to keep the clasp in the cuspid area as much toward the distal labial of the cuspid as I possibly could. Because again, one of the reasons for doing an attachment partial is to get away from clasps. So the aesthetic advantage is one of, the, one of the, the main advantages we'll talk about of a precision partial is the aesthetic advantage. Does it have some disadvantages? It may. Excessive preparation of the tooth, if you want to go with an intracoronal attachment. The need for vertical room, you need that, okay? And expense, those may be downsides. So what we did was just added these clasps, it tightened things up for the patient, and she actually was very, very happy. It snugged it up significantly for her. She was happy with the amount of retention, and she was most happy with not having to have crown lengthening, 
uh, ridge reduction here and crowns on the adjacent arch. If one looks at either a tooth or an attachment, I'm sorry, or an implant, you can see if a tooth has been endodontically treated ahead of time, one can either use, if you're going to use one of these stud or individual tooth type attachments, they can either stick outside the tooth or they can have a negative that goes down inside the tooth. So this was called the original zest anchor and it's the same with the implants. Then you go ahead and you have some sort of a little ball or clip on the implant. I tend to prefer these types of attachments, but I don't like the ball attachment. I like the zest locator. This is one that I'd done years ago for a lady that had this tooth that is endodontically treated. It broke off at the gum line, her pre-existing partial, that used to be the abutment tooth for the partial. So the abutment tooth breaks off at the gum line. It has already been treated endodontically. So what we did with that was we used one of these intra-radicular kind of attachments. So we went ahead, and this is just right on the natural root face. What you see here is stain, it's not caries. That scratch is really hard. So these kits came basically with a little slow speed drill that you drill a recess or a little hole down in the sort of, you can see right here. If your drill basically drills a recess down the root canal opening and the shape of the drill is exactly the same shape as the outer surface of the little attachment you're going to cement in this. So you cement the little attachment and then there are these little nylon, I call them a nylon pop bead or a little nylon ball that snaps in here and the top end of it you pick up with self-curing acrylic in the denture and we added a denture tooth onto the partial. So where the abutment tooth was, we cut part of the framework away with self-curing acrylic. We attached a denture tooth to the partial denture and then on the underside of the denture tooth we hollowed it out and with self-curing acrylic picked up this little pop bead that now goes down in this little recess. They're easy to do because you can do them in one appointment. What I would find over time is this patient had been wearing this for about five or six years and she was very fastidious about keeping this area clean. More commonly than not what I would see is patients did not keep this area fastidiously clean and we lost this thing to root surface caries. Different patient. Abutment tooth or a tooth on the partial broke off of the gum line had already been endodontically treated. So what we did with this tooth, since it had already been endodontically treated, instead of making a post and core and a crown to build the tooth up, we did what we call a post and coping. So we did a post down the root canal space and made a very low domed coping on the top of the root face. And then as lingually placed as possible, we placed a little attachment at the lingual aspect of the post and coping. So what we did here again was just add a tooth to the partial denture and then go ahead and pick the other half of this coping up in the partial. So there's your preparation. This is a maxillary bicuspid and this is a really good representation of any time you're planning on doing a crown or a fixed partial denture abutment in the maxillary arch. And if you're doing a crown or a fixed partial denture retainer on a maxillary bicuspid, be really aware of what the shape of a maxillary bicuspid is down near the CEJ. So can you see what a really pronounced concavity is present on the mesial of that tooth? And there's also one on the distal of the tooth, okay? So let's say you're missing a maxillary first bicuspid and you're gonna do a three unit fixed partial denture because you think that sounds like a really great treatment and we do it all the time. The thing to be aware of is if you've got any kind of periodontal involvement at all, so there's a little bone loss around that tooth, the preparation on your second bicuspid is gonna look like that on the mesial. So this is just for a post and coping. So the patient can take the partial out and basically take a toothbrush and clean around this real thoroughly. And in fact, I'm seeing this patient as soon as I leave clinic today because he's lost another tooth in another area and we're doing some more modifications. But this is still working just fine and when we did this, it was probably about 10, 12 years ago, okay? 
But can you picture this if this were the distal abutment of a three unit fixed partial denture? So let's say you had a full crown on the cuspid, a pontic here, and this was your crown on the second bicuspid. Can people see that you might have a plaque trap right there? And when you're following this patient after your fixed partial denture is done, if you were gonna treat it that way, and of course this guy's gonna get a floss threader in there three times a day, and wear his fluoride tray every night for at least an hour, right? Because all of your patients are that compliant. Okay, mine aren't, but I'm sure yours are. So that down the road a piece, you can run into problems with recurrent caries in these areas on maxillary bicuspids or any tooth that has a significant concavity mid-proximal from buccal to lingual. So anyway, we make this, and his canals happen to be parallel enough that we could go part way down both canals. Again, this is the lingual. So you do not repeat, you do not want to take this attachment retentive mechanism and center it on the occlusal aspect of the tooth. You want to keep it as lingual as you possibly can to leave you as much room as possible to set a tooth on top of this, on his partial. So we go ahead and we cement this thing in the mouth. We put the stainless steel cap with its inserts on this thing. We add a tooth to the partial denture. We had to grind a hole all the way through it. We're now going to take self-curing acrylic resin and pick this up. So this is the original insert that was in it. We swapped it out for a more retentive one when we removed this insert. Here's your stainless steel cap. We snap in a more retentive insert and the patient's happy. So he's worn this for many years. We got rid of the clasp in this area. So the clasp was gone and we get real good support from that. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.